This is The Red Line, where we interview three geopolitical experts on one big issue shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. I vividly remember the first time I visited Turkey. I'd just come out of a long stint in Iran, and I'd flown into Istanbul in the early afternoon. So once I'd checked in and put my bags down, I headed straight out to a bar to meet up with a couple of journalists. It had been a while since we'd seen each other, so we made some pleasantries, complained about the cab drivers trying to rip us off, grabbed a drink, and sat down at the long wooden table that had seemingly endured the condensation of 10,000 glasses. The establishment itself was nothing particularly special, but behind the bar sat an eight-foot embroidered portrait of Kemal Ataturk, the founder of the Turkish Republic, and anyone who's spent any time in Turkey knows just how important Ataturk is to the Turkish population. He took a shattered empire run into the ground by incompetent sultans and created a strong secular republic, one that granted women the right to vote nearly a decade before France, Japan, or Switzerland. And Ataturk's principles held true for the country even after his passing. That's how much his legacy meant to Turkish people, with Ataturk's words supposedly laying out the path for Turkey's future. In fact, many in Turkey were so staunch about staying on this path that for decades, every time a government strayed slightly away from the path laid out by Ataturk, the military would step in. They would remove the leader in a coup, travels to Ataturk's tomb, salutes him in his vision, and unlike governments in other countries, then hands power back over to the civilian administration with a mandate to continue Turkey down the path it was on. The military in Turkey acted as a kind of check on the government, a check to not move off the path laid before them. Well, that was until 2016, when the standard military coup failed. The military attempted to remove President Erdogan, who had been Prime Minister since 2003 and President since 2014. Many in the military saw President Erdogan moving off the path laid down by Ataturk nearly a century ago, with Erdogan increasingly edging away from secularism and into the orbit of the Middle East. Except that unlike the previous coups, Erdogan remained in power and having survived, would hit back at the military purging many of the commanders who plotted against him. And all of this was explained to us by a local man and who drank FS beer like his stomach contained a house fire. And this retelling of the story would then lead to one of the most heated arguments I've seen in a Turkish bar. After another Turkish local at the table interjected that Ataturk would have loved Erdogan. Ataturk loved democracy. Erdogan was voted in. And why does the military have the right to pick who should lead this country? That's not what democracies do. The table went silent for a second. And our original storyteller would sit up straight and bite back with, the military is defending the republic, not democracy. We have to maintain the proper course or lose everything the Turks won in the creation of this republic. This back and forth became increasingly heated and went back and forth for the next two and a half hours. And even after that two and a half hours, I still have no idea what the right answer is. Should Turkey follow the path laid out for them by their republic's founder and remain orientated toward Europe, or should they accept that democratic rule has also been laid out and follow the path laid out by the most Middle Eastern focused leader Turkey has seen since the Ottoman Empire, President Erdogan. For now, it seems that Turkey is rediscovering its place within Middle Eastern politics. Is this the death of Kemalism, a rejection of Europe and a backpedaling toward the foreign policy of the late Ottoman Empire? Or is this the death of Kemalism and the democratic rights of the Turkish people no longer matter? as the people's choice can be removed by military coup or the stacking of the deck to keep Erdogan in power. Is Turkey about to give up being an outsider in Europe and readily embrace its regional power status within the Middle East? These are the questions that were going round that table in the bar before things got too heated. And these are the questions we'll be asking our experts this week. And to help us answer this first one, we turn to our first guest. Part 1 Forsaking the Father. Well, the short answer to your first question about Kemalism is no. Uh, I think if you ask me this question maybe uh, 10 years ago, I would have said uh, that there was a strong resistance backed uh, by a majority of Turkish society. Uh, that was opposed to Kemalism, or maybe I should say that was very critical of the mistakes that Kemalism has made in terms of integrating um, ethnic and, and religious minorities. I think Erdogan's rise to power was in many ways emblematic of Kemalism's weaknesses. But now 
Erdogan being at the helm for, for two decades, we are seeing uh, an unprecedented rise in support for Kemalism. Uh, and I've been watching this for, for some time. Every year, uh, the number of people who go to Atatürk's, uh, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk's tomb to, to visit, to show solidarity, has been rising. Uh, so I think that's a, a great indicator. And even uh, the, this whole trend of uh, increasing support for Kemalism uh, has reached uh, such a level that even Erdogan himself is now embracing Kemal Atatürk. So I think this is a very interesting trend in the sense that um, there is now almost a nostalgia for for Mustafa Kemal Atatürk and the initial years of the Republic. And I think the underlying theme there is nostalgia for secularism. And, and it has something to do with the way President Erdogan and his, his ruling party have used religion to justify authoritarianism and corruption. Even among uh, the children uh, of families who have supported President Erdogan, uh, even uh, children who belong to very religious, pious families, they are now embracing secularism more and more. Gunnel Toll is the founding director of the Middle East Institute's Turkey program and a senior fellow for the Frontier Europe Initiative. She's also an adjunct professor at the George Washington University's Institute for Middle East Studies and wrote her dissertation on the radicalization of Turkish Islamist movements. She's also written extensively on Turkey-US relations, Turkish domestic politics, Turkish foreign policy, and relations between Ankara and the Kurds. And we're thrilled to have her on the program today. Uh, in the nationalist circles too, uh, I think Erdogan's alliance with the nationalists and the main nationalist party, which is the Nationalist Action Party, MHP, that has really damaged and divided the nationalists. So you see, especially in the young generation, uh, this, this growing trend of embracing secularism even more and, 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 and opposition to Erdogan's use of religion to cover up uh, corruption and legitimize authoritarianism. So I think Erdogan sees embracing Mustafa Kemal Atatürk as a way to, to uh, counterbalance that trend. If we go back to Turkey's history and look at Anatürk's main principles, one of the main ones was to orientate Turkey toward the West. Atatürk even referred to Europe as the only civilization and called time and time again for a French-style republic for Turkey. In many ways, he did achieve that back in the 20s. Erdogan, on the other hand, seems to be moving closer to a more autocratic style of rule and comparably much more antagonistic with his European partners. How does the Turkish population feel when they compare Erdogan's policies to those prescribed by Ataturk? Whether Turkey will turn east or west, I think this is a related question too. Right after, maybe a few years after the, the conflict in Syria started, there were public opinion surveys conducted in Turkey, which found that the popular support for Turkey's EU membership was on the rise. And that was in direct response to Erdogan's Syria policies, because many people, including uh, people who supported Erdogan, thought that his relaxed border policies and the fact that there are millions of Syrian refugees in, living in Turkey right now, they were critical of Erdogan's Syria policy. And they thought that Turkey was too involved in, in the regional chaos. So it was best for Turkey to turn its face towards Europe. So I would say, given the anti-refugee sentiment and given how strong uh, the criticism of Erdogan's Syria policy is, I think I, I expect that, that trend to rise in, in the coming years. Erdogan has now been the president of Turkey since 2014, although many people explain that Erdogan was quite different during those first years of his presidency. Most analysts we spoke to, in fact, for this piece usually divide Erdogan's rule into a pre- and post-2016 coup attempt phase. Can you take us through how the attempted coup in 2016 changed Erdogan and the direction of the country? 2016 was a, was a milestone in Turkish politics and also in the psyche of President Erdogan. But I, I think I would first refer to 2015 as another milestone in the sense that uh, in 2015 June elections, President Erdogan's party for the first 
first time in many, many years, uh, lost its parliamentary majority. And, and you see a dramatic volta face after, after that, after that loss, because before June 2015, uh, Erdogan had embarked on a, uh, on a project to grant more rights to the Kurds, a peace initiative with the Kurds had begun. There was a, a, um, a ceasefire uh, in place, uh, but with 2015 election lost, uh, Erdogan reverted to uh, the militaristic and aggressive, heavy-handed uh, policies of, of, of the Kemalists. So from 2015 onwards, the, the Kurdish peace process was dead, fighting with the PKK resumed, and, and I think that was all because of uh, the realization by Erdogan that, that the Kurdish peace process that he had launched in an effort to granting more rights to Kurds, but mostly because Erdogan wanted to uh, appeal to the Kurds to realize his dream of switching the country's parliamentary system to a presidential system. So he really wanted to rely on the Kurds and the conservative segments of the country to establish a super presidential system. But that strategy failed. And the 2015, June 2015 election result was the most uh, significant sign that that strategy was not going to work. So he switched tactics and he allied himself with the nationalists. Uh, and I think that's a significant turning uh, point because that alliance with the nationalists paid off. Thanks to that alliance, Erdogan could be able to secure a majority in the, in the referendum that would switch the country's parliamentary system to a presidential system. Uh, the following year, he got elected as, as the country's first uh, president, popularly elected president in 2018. Um, so he really banked on that alliance, nationalist alliance, to consolidate his rule. Uh, and I think that alliance with the nationalists had dramatic implications both on his domestic policy and his regional policies and, and, and foreign policy uh, in general. Then came the 2016 coup attempt. And I think that coup attempt, um, aside from the fact that it really increased Erdogan's paranoia about um, the people who were close to him, I think the, the 2016 coup attempt strengthened his alliance with the nationalists. Um, the, the, uh, the positions that had been filled by uh, Gulenists, for instance, in, in bureaucracy, they were filled with nationalist uh, MHP supporters. So we see this dramatic change uh, in the composition of Turkish bureaucracy, which in turn had an impact on uh, Turkish foreign policy and domestic politics. So yes, uh, 2016 failed coup attempt uh, had very important uh, implications. It strengthened uh, the alliance Erdogan had cultivated with the nationalists uh, the year before. And that nationalist alliance, I think, really made Turkey's foreign policy and regional policy uh, very uh, militaristic, aggressive, and it promoted an approach uh, which uh, really adopted an aggressive approach in both in the Middle East and, and also uh, in places like Eastern Mediterranean. I remember, uh, Turkey's first military incursions into Syria came right after, almost a month after uh, the failed coup attempt. Before then, Turkish military was reluctant to uh, intervene in Syria, citing concerns that Turkey had no B plan, no exit plan. Uh, they really did not want to rely on Russia uh, to operate in Syria. But after the coup attempt, I think it was also uh, the military's attempt to, uh, to, to rebuild its, its badly damaged uh, image. And they couldn't say no to Erdogan because they wanted to prove their loyalty. So all this culminated in what we've been seeing in, uh, in, in Turkish actions in Syria since 2016. Before he cozied up to the nationalists to secure his parliament, Erdogan was comparatively pro-Kurdish. Although since that period, the crackdowns on the Kurds have been quite troubling for many. But after this amount of bad blood between the two and years of crackdowns on the Kurds, do you think Erdogan could ever return to a point where he attempts to repair the relationship with that population? Or do you think that doing so would upset the nationalists and break up his parliamentary coalition? removing any hope of the AKP being able to legislate. Is there any hope of repairing the relationship between Erdogan and the Kurdish population? 
Anyone who follows Erdogan's policies in the last uh, two decades, I think, should know that one should never say say never because he's a a, a very pragmatic uh, leader. He can make U turns very easily. So I I I can easily see a time when he reaches out to the Kurds. And in fact, just last year, he wanted to to do that. He paid a visit to Diyarbakir, and Diyarbakir is a is considered the spiritual capital of Turkey's Kurds. And, and, and he talked about how he was still, he still had that spirit of, of uh, reconciliation with the Kurds. So that was a dramatic move for a man who basically criminalized the legitimate uh, Kurdish opposition, jailed uh, Kurdish activists, uh, journalists. So that was a dramatic uh, U-turn, I think. So can we expect another U-turn? Sure. Erdogan can easily do that. But of course, what complicates things is is the fact that he is now in alliance with the nationalists. Uh, But of course, the the problem here for Erdogan is that that nationalist alliance that he had cultivated is not as useful as it used to be. Uh, We've seen that in 2019 local elections when Despite his alliance with the nationalists, his party lost almost all major cities in Turkey. So I think that was a wake-up call for Erdogan, that nationalism was not paying off. And I think that's when he decided to consider the possibility of a return to the, the, the peace talks with the Kurds. But I would say this, I think, yes, he can do that, but the big question is, would the Kurds reciprocate that? Uh, I see that as a more distant possibility because I think uh, Erdogan has lost the Kurdish vote, even even those who always voted for Erdogan since the establishment of the AKP in 2002. Historically, the Kurds have been divided. Uh, 50% have voted for um, ethnic uh, pro-Kurdish parties and the, the remaining 50% traditionally they voted for uh, center-right parties. So there is a large uh, group of, of Kurds who had voted for, for Erdogan, but I think the turning point for them came in 2014, and that was um, during the, the, the siege of Kobani, the northern Syrian town of Kobani. It was under attack by ISIS forces, and the Kurds were pleading for help from Erdogan uh, for him to open the border so the Iraqi Kurdish groups can step in to help the, the, the Syrian Kurds fighting against ISIS. Erdogan, until the last minute, did not do that. He closed the borders. And uh, in 2014, as a response to Erdogan's inaction in the face of, a, of an ISIS massacre, the Kurds in Turkey took it to the streets, and, and we've seen demonstrations across the country. Uh, so those Kobani protests, I say, would they, they, it, they became the turning point in the way the Kurds, even conservative Kurds, uh, saw Erdogan. So that's a major turning point, and I think Erdogan has lost a, a lot of credibility among Kurdish voters. Uh, so it doesn't mean, obviously, it doesn't mean that he, he, he can still get votes, um, but but I think his image has been tarnished, and and I think the biggest indication of that is is the rise in popularity of the main opposition secularist party, the CHP. We we've, we've been seeing that for some time now. That after Kobani, the CHP is gaining ground in the Kurdish region, which was something that was unthinkable previously, because of of, of Kemalism's traditional line of denying the existence of Kurds. The Kurds had been uh, uh, really put a distance between themselves and and the CHP, but that's been changing. So that's just telling me how much ground Erdogan has lost among the Kurdish electorate. The military have stepped in multiple times in Turkish history to remove Turkish presidents if they stray too far from the national path. Although after every coup, they always head back to the monument to Ataturk, salute him and hand power back to the civil administration. After the failed coup in 2016, though, many senior military figures have been removed from the army and replaced with Erdogan loyalists. And during Erdogan's term, the military has gained a lot of additional power, funding, and influence within Turkish politics. If the center-left CHP were to win the upcoming election, do you think that the military would intervene to maintain the good deal they have with Erdogan at the moment, or simply remain loyal to the civilian administration? 
I think the politicization of Turkish military, especially after the, the, the coup attempt in 2016, has been a concern to many, including uh, the CHP leadership. That's a fact, and that's something that I, I, uh, I hear often from uh, American military officials who work uh, with Turkish military in places like Syria. They complain about the fact that Turkish military is not what it used to be. It's not as professional uh, because uh, the, the process that was launched after the, the coup attempt really politicized, uh, which was formerly a very professional uh, NATO, NATO mil military. Uh, so how can you undo that if the CHP comes to power? Is h how reforming the military, uh, is, is that even possible? So I think uh, th this, is, this is a general question that we ask on a daily basis, which is Erdogan has been in power for so long and the damage that he's done to Turkish institutions is unprecedented. There's always been, bureaucracy has always been politicized. So this is not a, a problem that Erdogan himself created. But I think the level of, he's just taken this to a whole new level. We cannot talk about institutions anymore. Professionalism is gone. Even in, in key, key sectors, uh, in key institutions of, of Turkish bureaucracy, such as defense, uh, it's, I mean, everyone often talks about how Turkish local defense industry is booming. And they're right in many sense because um, Turkish drones are, 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 have become really popular. Uh, they've turned the tide in places like, uh, like Nagorno-Karabakh. But on the other hand, if you talk to insiders, uh, you'll see the level of uh, erosion in, in, in professionalism. Uh, all these go government contracts in the defense sector, for instance, they go to Erdogan proxies, those names who are, uh, who have no previous experience in the defense sector, but they get the government contracts. And, and we see them publicly, how that strategy failed. Uh, a close Erdogan uh, ally, for instance, his name is Etem Sanjak. Uh, he was in the pharmaceutical business uh, before he was awarded a, a defense contract. Um, he just, he just, uh, he's now isolated and he failed to deliver. And, and you, you hear uh, a lot of stories like that from defense industry officials who obviously are, are too afraid to speak on the record, but they say that privately to convey their, their unease. So this is all to say that the destruction, the damage that he's done to institutions is not easy to undo. So if the opposition somehow uh, wins the elections, it's going to take a lot of time and energy and effort uh, for, for the new government to, to build those institutions, but also more importantly, to build the public trust uh, in those institutions. And that includes Turkish military. Erdogan has been getting much more involved throughout the Middle East in places like Libya, Somalia, Nagorno-Karabakh, Central Asia, all over the place. He's also talked a lot more about Turkey's role in counterterrorism. And with the US increasingly losing its appetite for Middle East interventions, will we likely see Turkey step up and replace the US in that role in places like Syria, Iraq or Afghanistan? You know, Erdogan has always used foreign policy and that includes the fight against joining the fight against terrorism as a, as a domestic policy tool. Uh, the, the foreign, foreign relations, international relations, they've, uh, they've rarely been seen Erdogan is the product of international pushes and, and pushes and pulls. It's mostly about his efforts to to consolidate power. That's why I think uh, if you talk to American officials from the Department of, of Defense, State Department, and especially from those who served in under the Obama administration, they often um, talk about. Uh, how uncomfortable they were during the rise of, of ISIS, when in 2014 ISIS became a, a big threat uh, when it captured cities in Iraq and later in Syria. And they often talk about the lengthy conversations that they had held with Turkish officials trying to convince Erdogan to join the fight against ISIS. What did Erdogan do at the time? He saw ISIS as a tool he could use against uh, the Assad regime, but also as a, an effective fighting force 
against the Kurds. So he dragged his feet. He was reluctant to join the fight against ISIS. He was reluctant to open uh, the Turkish air base in Jirlik so that the US could use the air base in the fight against ISIS. Instead, he wanted to use that opportunity to uh, basically realize his domestic goals. He wanted to force the Obama administration to pursue a more forceful policy in Syria. He instrumentalized everything, including the fight against, uh, against terrorism, against ISIS. Uh, so will he, th that's his MO, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. But the question is, given uh, t t Turkey's domestic problems, including a declining economy, including social unrest and the nationalist backlash against millions of Syrian refugees and other social uh, and political problems, uh, I think there will come a time when Erdogan will not be able to use foreign policy to fix his domestic problems. He will be forced to look inwards, he will be forced to address those domestic challenges, and, and I think that will certainly uh, curtail uh, Turkey's role in, in international affairs. Turkey's place in the Middle East is changing. But then again, so is the region as a whole. Just think about Turkey when Erdogan became Prime Minister back in 2003. Erdogan became Prime Minister six days before the US invaded Iraq. ISIS wasn't a thing. The Arab Spring was still eight years away. Syria was a peaceful country that tourists regularly went to to see the historical sites. And the US had somewhat stabilized Afghanistan. Turkey was also hopeful of EU membership, with the relations between Ankara and Berlin increasingly close at that time. Now compare that to now, and Erdogan would be at the top of Turkish politics throughout that entire period. And on a timeline that long, the decisions you make will often come home to roost while you're still in power. Erdogan, for example, was publicly supportive of the Arab Spring in the beginning, hoping these nations would all follow Turkey into democracies. But now that most of these nations have fallen back into war ways or been crushed by their central governments, Erdogan now has to shake the hands of the nations and leaders that he was supportive of being overthrown. Another decision taken by Erdogan was the Turkish intervention in Syria. But was it a good idea? Should Erdogan have stayed out of the country? Or should he have gone in way earlier when ISIS was still small and manageable? Should Erdogan have supported the Kurds and let them get stronger? Or should he have taken his good relationship with the Saudi government and called on them to crack down on funding heading toward ISIS? But more importantly, what is Turkey's endgame in the Middle East's most perplexing predicament? The war in Syria. Well, to answer that... We turn to our second guest. Part 2. Contentious Comrades Well, I, I've been uh, skeptical about the death of Kemalism as well as the entry into the European Union for a long time. Uh, I guess we can uh, mince words or, or split hairs on terminology here, but there's Kemalism and then there's Ataturkism, right? Ataturkism is such a powerful force and that's sort of instrumentalizing some of the principles, although not all, and certainly the iconography and the identity of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, which has been a very strong independent Turkey, one that is aligned with the West, but not integrated with the West, if you will, and one that is jealously uh, guarding its national autonomy, independence, and, and strategic uh, freedom of movement, shall we say. This is at odds with the idea of subordinating your uh, national sovereignty to a multilateral organization. It's hard enough in the case of NATO, where we have frictions, and that's just the defense alliance. But the, the idea that the Europeans, who probably don't want to accept Turkey anyway, and they really don't hide that fact much anymore on socio-cultural grounds, the fact that they would uh, demand the, the right to have, uh, and you know they won't let Turkey in for their own reasons, but they would also, if they were to let them in, demand sort of veto rights on all sorts of domestic policies that the Turks being prickly uh, sovereign sovereignty loving nationalists in their own right would not be want to deliver over to them. So it's sort of what I call a pious fiction where the Turks pretend to still want to be part of the European Union and the European Union pretends to still consider letting them in. But in reality, it's not in the national political cultures of either side to do so. Rich Alton is a retired U.S. Army colonel and non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, 
specializing in Turkey and Middle Eastern affairs. Rich also served at the US Department of State as both a military and civilian advisor, and in the office of the Special Representative for Syria. And in addition to that, he also served as the US Defense Attaché to Kabul, and as the Deputy Chief of Staff for Training and Development and the US Security Coordinator in Jerusalem. And we're thrilled to have Rich on the show today. I know a lot of Turkish soldiers, current and former, as for background, I served uh, at my first lieutenant assignment uh, in Turkey in 1990-91 before the end of the Cold War. I served again in Turkey uh, at the U.S. headquarters in Ankara between 2001-2003 and then was in Afghanistan as uh, a liaison officer from U.S. forces to Turkish forces for a year at a remote location uh, in 2009 and 2010. So I've had these slices every 10 years to get a view of what's going on inside the Turkish military. I speak Turkish. Uh, and with the network of friendships I have, I think I have a pretty unique uh, window on how that process has gone. So what I've seen is an evolution that was not started by, but was certainly accelerated by the failed factional uprising in 2016. And that has been the gradual subordination of the Turkish military to civilian political control, which in most cases is considered to be a good thing. Certainly, if you go back and look at U.S. and Western literature on Turkey in the 1990s and the early aughts, what we saw was a, a longing, a strong desire to have the Turkish military politically defanged. I'm making air quotes with my fingers there because this idea that they had been a Praetorian military, a domestically focused military, uh, focused on counterterrorism for sure against the PKK, but also setting the bounds of political activity. That seemed out of sort of anachronistic, let's say, uh, with the tenor of the 21st century, people wanted a more democratized Turkey. Well, sometimes you need to be careful what you ask for. They got the democratized Turkey when the AKP and President Erdogan, then initially Prime Minister Erdogan, set about some reforms and some other steps, shall we say, to defang the Turkish military. And people cheered that in many ways. Uh, one first big sea change happened in 2010, 2011, when uh, the AKP party of President Erdogan, working together with uh, officers and journalists and judges from the, the Gulen movement, which at that time was allied with the AKP, held a series of trials uh, that were based, in my view, and the view of many uh, forensic experts on fabricated and or badly manipulated evidence to remove about half the general officer uh, leadership of the Turkish military. As a matter of fact, they were able to bring down the chief of staff of the Turkish mil uh, military, Ilker Boshbu. And after that, it became clear that the Tur uh, Turkish military no longer had the high ground, so to speak, within the Turkish state. What that led to was the coup in 2016, because the people who had successfully defanged the, that general officer corps and changed the nature of the Turkish military were in fact led by a cabal of Gulenist um, officers. And not, not all Gulenists supported that coup and not everyone involved in the coup was Gulenist in my view, but I think there's pretty strong evidence uh, that many European and US authors have um, explicated and, and, and spoken of uh, establishing this sort of pattern of the, of the Gulenists at the center of the coup. Now, you can blame Erdogan for having brought them into his circle of trust to begin with to defang the secularist wing of the military. But in fact, he became a late, late convert um, to a Turkish military that was rid of those influences. So based on my experience that I've talked about before over the decades of seeing what happened uh, in the Turkish military from 1990 to 2016 and beyond, I will say that uh, while it was an extremely painful experience for Turkey and the Turkish military, to go through this process of first having a purge of the secularists and then having a purge of the Gulenists and their fellow travelers afterwards has in the end had propitious effects on the Turkish military. Why? Because they have been subordinated to civilian political control. We happen to, for the West, I say, uh, happen not particularly like or find him to be an easy civilian political authority, but that's Erdogan. He is the civilian political authority. He has refocused the Turkish military on external missions. So at the same time that we've seen Turkish defense industry produce their own tanks, their own helicopters, uh, most famously their own drones, and they're making uh, great strides in terms of defense industry, they've also reached over 50% professionalization of their force. So in other words, they're decreasing the number of conscripts who have little training and little real desire to be doing that kind of work and increase the number of contract and professional soldiers, both officers and non-commissioned officers. And these people have extreme dedication to their job. They don't have the political divisions that sort of uh, rankled the Turkish military for two decades or three. And they're getting pretty good at power projection. You may have noticed in the campaigns in Syria, Libya, Azerbaijan, and elsewhere, 
the Turks are training proxy forces, they are operating irregular warfare, and they're conducting conventional warfare, as well as counter-terror oper uh, counter operations. In short, uh, the coup, the failed coup, sort of led to reforms that consolidated this change that's been going on for 10 or 20 years from reorienting from a Praetorian military to a power projection military. And I think as a result, we have a new power player in the region that while not on a par with the United States, certainly in terms of military power, is far more formidable than just about any other power uh, in its neighborhood. When we're discussing Turkish military operations, the two most people will point to are Operation Euphrates Shield and Operation Olive Branch, which are the Turkish interventions into Syria. Can you take us through how these operations unfolded it and whether you think they've been successful or not? I have many friends not uh, in the region, not just Turks and it was an Israeli uh, military officer who once told, uh, told me uh, with a little uh, a bit of uh, schadenfreude that you Americans are solutionists. You think there's a solution to everything. This fixation on an exit strategy is a manifestation of the American belief that every foreign entanglement or military operation should have a clear entry point and a clear exit point because we want to leave and go home back to Fortress America at the end of the day. The Turks don't have that luxury uh, in the same way that the Israelis cannot walk away from Gaza or Lebanon or some of their problems. So when we look at the Turkish success or failure in these military operations, we have to ask the question, what's their time frame? Are they trying to leave next year? I don't think so. Uh, similarly uh, to the Israelis who stayed in Lebanon 18 years because they knew after the 1982 war there was going to be a power vacuum that uh, Beirut could not fill, they stayed in southern Lebanon for 18 years. I, I don't see any reason the Turks won't stay at least that long in northern Syria because they have a similar problem. Damas uh, Damascus is not inclined to and does not have the ability to fill a power vacuum in the north after the civil war. And the majority of the population in the north uh, is antagonistic to their own government in Damascus uh, for different reasons. And there's part of them east of the river, east of the Euphrates, that are allied with uh, the YPG, the U.S. partner force against ISIS, which is uh, credibly linked to the PKK, which has been fighting a war against Turkey for 40 years. And the majority of the people, on the other hand, are supportive of the Syrian opposition, dislike the PKK and the YPG, but also Assad. Now, if Turkey were to leave tomorrow, uh, they would be faced with the 5 million, according to New York Times research uh, from last year, uh, at least 5 million people protected in the Turkish zones on top of the 4 million Syrians that are already in Turkey. So a new wave of discontented refugees into Turkey and, and thence uh, into parts of Europe is one of the reasons they'll stay until there's something like a political uh, settlement there. Now, in terms of the operations then, they all have served a common purpose in my view, and this has been long and clearly and consistently uh, enunciated by President Erdogan. He wants what he calls a safe zone. People deride that in the West because they say, well, it's not going to be safe because there's some bad people in it and other bad people attacking it. Well, that's true, true enough, but it's a safe zone that doesn't have to be 100% perfect. So to construct this safe zone, the Turks have committed commando forces, air support, some trainers and logistics to partner with a force called the Free Syrian Army. This is, uh, or sorry, the Syrian National Army. This is the remnants of the previously uh, designated Free Syrian Army. It's oppositionists. Uh, of uneven quality, but the Turks have tried to turn them into the holding force, if you will, the military force that holds onto these territories it's taken. This has unfolded the campaign of training and, and cooperation with the Syrian National Army uh, in a series of sort of uh, ongoing training operations, but also uh, cooperative military operations. You mentioned a couple of them. You had Euphrates Shield, which happened very shortly after the failed coup in 2016. You had Oper Operation Olive Branch, uh, in Afrin in 2018. <clears throat> in October 2019, you had Peace Spring, which was east of the river. And less heralded has been Turkish uh, military support to the HTS, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, the group that holds Idlib province. Now, uh, HTS is a group with a checkered past. They have terror ties, although they say that they have renounced that. So the Turks don't really manage or run them like they do the Na uh, Syrian National Army in the other three areas. But it can be considered part of this safe zone too, in that it's doing the same things, keeping out YPG, keeping out ISIS, and keeping out Assad, while protecting the refugees, that Tur or the, the people that Turkey does not want to see become refugees. Each of these four operations, because there was one in Idlib too called Spring Shield in 2020, in which the Turks uh, and HTS fought together against the Assad forces and Iranian Revolutionary Guard forces that were there as well. Very strange compilation of friends and enemies in these wars. But 
in each of these four cases uh, that I've outlined, the Turkish military operation secured terrain, prevented uh, control by the Assad forces, and largely ejected the YPG slash PKK from these areas. The Turks have had incomplete success, uh, but some progress in bringing electricity and food and housing, education, postal services and whatnot uh, to these areas, which leads some people to say, well, look, they're going to stay. It's neo-Ottoman expansionist. But I know from my discussions in Turkey, that's not the plan. They want to leave. They want most Syrians in Turkey to go back, but they have to have a zone uh, for now that is out of government control and therefore serves as something of a bargaining chip for the end of conflict negotiations that are certain to come at some point. So if Syria is a defensive action to prevent problems spilling over the border in Turkey, what are the objectives then for Ankara in Libya, the Red Sea and Somalia? What are they hoping to get from these conflicts thousands of miles from the Turkish border? Well, the Turks don't clearly separate out their military investments, so to speak, from their economic and diplomatic investments. I've written about this for the Washington Institute previously, but they have this idea of uh, strategic depth that they've referred to before. That's uh, the concept that they have cultural ties, ties of religion and sentiment and history to many peoples in many regions, including the Balkans, including the Black Sea, the Caucasus, and Africa. Turkey sees itself as an African power. So in Libya, in Somalia, in Ethiopia, in Niger, in many of these other countries, Turkey starts by increasing diplomats and aid, and they have more than tripled um, their diplomatic representations in Africa over the last 15 years. They have more than sextupled their trade to Africa over the last 15 years as well. It is all a package. So you see diplomats coming, you see civilian businesses coming, you see schools opening, and you see military trainers coming. So the package that they send for military operations is normally pretty light. And if we look at Somalia, it's uh, it numbers in the high hundreds or perhaps low thousands. They've opened a major base there called uh, Camp Turksom that does training of Somali forces, and then some Somali soldiers come to Turkey as well. On the side of the angels, I might say, in the Somali conflict, because they're primarily trying to help the Somali forces against al-Shabaab, which is on no one's uh, short list of uh, <laughs> good actors in Africa. So I think that's probably a pretty good uh, way of looking at these sorts of investments. Qatar is another example. During the Gulf Rift in 2017-18, uh, when Saudi Arabia uh, the Emirates and other Gulf states tried to essentially blockade and force into submission Doha. Uh, the Qataris turned to the Turks and expanded a small base that had already been there. Turkey sent enough forces to deter direct military action against Qatar. And then when Turkey's had its various um, currency-related economic crises, the Qataris stepped in. They, they provide gas supplies, but also monetary support for the Turkish lira. I'm certainly no fan of the AKP and President Erdogan's currency management uh, and financial management. Clearly, they are not as clever about managing the economy as they are about managing this portfolio of interest elsewhere. But I would say that thinking that these are expensive investments that can't be sustained uh, overseas in military terms because of domestic economic problems is looking at the problem wrong. I, I think what we have to understand is that they're actually gaining economic and other strategic benefits from these investments, which they've really only had to do in a major combatant way in a couple of cases, with Libya, of course, being a prime example. When reading a lot of the academic texts around this issue, some point to Turkey wanting to eventually join one power block or another in the Middle East, and others speculate Turkey wants to become its own political pole within the region, that others who are not looking to Riyadh or Tehran or Jerusalem may be able to look towards Ankara for direction. But how do you think Turkey sees its future position within the Middle East region? question for Turkey is not one of, of polls. They, they recognize that there's multipolarity on a global level. When you talk to Turks, their uh, great frustration with the United States is that we still tend to use, uh, you know, view the world in unipolar terms with the United States as the main pole and everybody else either as an axis of evil of sorts, recalcitrant states, or firmly on the side of the United States. Well, you know, you look at the map from India, uh, you know, leave alone the antagonistic states to the United States, such as uh, Iran, the People's Republic of China, Russia, Venezuela. But even major countries like India essentially don't want to pick sides in these conflicts. What they want to do is maximize their own uh, sort of maneuver room and have an independent foreign policy and have as many relationships multilaterally and multi-axially as possible. I think this is what Turkey's doing as well in its own region. Turkey knows it's a middle-sized power. I don't think they seek to become, or at least not at this stage, seek to become a major 
pole in a, a global multipolar system. They don't see themselves as the top six power, top seven power, but they clearly see themselves as a top 10, 15, 20 power. And what that means is to maintain your own uh, profitability and your own sovereignty, you have to have a rolling series of understandings and alliances and never permanently in anybody's camp. So this is why they make pragmatic deals with the Russians from time to day. They make pragmatic deals with the Iranians. And yet they're killing Iranian soldiers uh, or their forces are fighting against Iranians and Iranian uh, sponsored proxies, both in Iraq and Syria. So this is a strange bedfellows. They've had uh, lots of friction with Israel, the Emirates and Saudi Arabia over the last three or four years. But this multi-axial approach demands that you make no enmities permanent, just as you make no alliances fully binding. So I, I think that what they're really trying to do is operate within global multipolarity by becoming, I, we, we can say, an independent regional pole, but not with a block of countries clustered around them, with maneuver room uh, dealing with quasi-friends and quasi-enemies throughout the region. It's a little bit outside our discussion today, but it is a complicated relationship I think we should ask about, and that's Turkey's relationship between Ukraine and Russia, as Turkey is happy to work with both sides whilst at the same time poking the eyes of both sides as well. As an example, Turkey talks openly about supporting Ukraine, selling them drones, refusing to recognize Crimea or the Donbass, but at the same time they also try and block Sweden and Finland entering NATO, don't come down very hard on Russian sanctions, and have bought Russian equipment, and Erdogan has been on good terms with Putin for quite a long time. So through all of this, what are Turkey's aims in Ukraine at the moment? So the loss of sovereignty and the end of an independent Ukraine would be a strategic disaster for Turkey. This is, I think, their primary guiding policy principle. But their second policy principle is that you can't live next door to a nuclear armed power with a massive economy, resources you need, including tourists and energy supplies. You can't live next to them and hope for their utter collapse or their utter defeat. So what the Turks have been aiming for, I think, first of all, is to avoid the conflict. Once the conflict started, to ensure through the provision, not just the Bayraktars, but there's other armored vehicles, there's been discrete military and intelligence sharing, um, sorry, military uh, training and intelligence sharing. They have gone to bat for Ukraine. They enabled Ukrainian grain to get out. This was a pretty major uh, diplomatic feat to convince the Russians, who certainly get some benefits in terms of their own grain being shipped out as well. Uh, but the fact that they have done these things has massively helped Ukraine. And let's not forget that Turkey was helping Ukraine really from 2016, 2017 on. They're, they've had military agreements, and it's not, again, not just the drones, at a time when the United States and Europeans were against sending lethal aid to Kiev. So uh, there's no doubt that they have put the money where their mouth is to protect the, the sovereignty and territorial integrity. They've also uh, refused to recognize uh, Russian annexation of Crimea uh, or of the Donbass. Yet they also, I think, fear a catastrophic Russian defeat because we're... Russia to fall into turmoil of some sort with Putin overthrown and their armies in disarray. I think they uh, fear that they would lose an important counterbalance to Western hegemony as well. This hyper power unipolar moment of, of the United States uh, from 2000 or maybe even 1991 uh, until, uh, say, 2010 was a searing experience for Turkey. Turkey, again, as a balancing power, does not want to live in a world in which the United States can dictate terms to them either. So for instance, in Syria and Iraq, which we referred to earlier, uh, Turkey believes, uh, most Turks believe that the United States was trying to destroy these states to create a independent Kurdish statelets that it could then control and wants to do the same thing to Turkey. If that's your belief, uh, as it is for many in Ankara and Istanbul, then you have to see that Russia as a, a country, for instance, in Syria that wants to see Assad continue uh, control over a unified Syria, is an important counterbalance to sort of provocative actions by the United States. It's a very strange relationship in which Russia is an important counterbalance against the West, even though Turkey's primary allegiance is to the West. That will say 5149. Uh, in the case of Ukraine, I think Turkey will go continue to go to the mat to ensure not just that Ukraine survives, but that Turkey's partnership with Ukraine economically, militarily, politically grows deeper and stronger post-war. And this, uh, for instance, in last week, there was a, an agreement signed particularly for reconstruction, post-war reconstruction, and Turkey's role. This was signed by President Erdogan and President Zelensky uh, during a, a visit by Erdogan to Lviv. So yeah, Turkey's definitely mostly on Ukraine's side, but with the huge caveat that they need to maintain a healthy Russia, not a strategically defeated Russia as a global counterbalancing partner. 
Well, obviously there is the Turkish election coming up very soon. And if Erdogan was to lose that election, do you think that we see an end to all this intervention or that this is a baked in bipartisan approach to foreign policy? On a scale of one to 10, er Erdogan's sort of activist foreign policy has been an 11. And I think it would dial back some if we were to see an opposition run government. I, I think that an opposition run government would want to dial back some in Syria. Uh, it, it might uh, decrease some of the engagements in Africa and South Asia. But for instance, in Iraq, where the PKK is based in the northeast mountains of Kandil, no Turkish government, and the opposition has a large number of nationalists in their coalition, no Turkish government can afford to thumb its nose at national sentiment and simply give the PKK a free pass. Plus, Turkey's making money right off of drones and off of some of the other military sales. There is a, a financial as well as a strategic interest in maintaining this network of relationships. So I think what you see under the opposition is dialing it back from an 11 to maybe an 8. You'd see an opposition that, that tries to avoid antagonizing some folks in the West, especially Washington, quite as obviously, but they're not going to be pliant partners. You won't see any Turkish government turn away entirely from this foreign poly, policy activism uh, and from the, the strong military content to it. Turks, you know, I think we can ask the same question people used to ask about uh, Saddam in Iraq, right? People said, is Saddam Saddam because of Iraq or is Iraq Iraq because of Saddam? With the thought being, if you remove Saddam, then everything becomes easy and democracy breaks up. Well, of course, Erdogan, I would not want to uh, compare him to Saddam personally, and it's a, a NATO ally, but there's an analog, uh, analog of a question we can ask here. Do, you, do we think Turkey is Turkey because of Erdogan or do we think Erdogan is Erdogan because of Turkey? And I think if the West bets that things are going to get much more symbiotic and much easier with a post-Erdogan Turkey, that they're misreading both the current constellation within the opposition and also Turkish history. Turkey's never been an easy partner for the West. They've always wanted to be a partner of the West, but never to be a pliant subordinate of the West. And that will continue, meaning that we'll have uh, plenty of frictions regardless of who's sitting in Beshtepe uh, in Ankara at the presidential palace. Turkey is punching way above its weight when it comes to foreign intervention. To put it in perspective, this is a country whose economy is roughly the size of Belgium's, whilst also having a population almost eight times the size of Belgium's. And even with this hindrance, they're still fighting on multiple continents, and making deals everywhere from Kazakhstan to Pakistan to Sudan to Morocco. And all of this is mightily impressive to the outside world. But what happens when you look behind the curtain at the internal economy of Turkey? Well, that tells a slightly different story. And to take us through that, we turn to our third guest. Part 3. An Exhausted Empire I think Turkey uh, it retains the aspiration in the sense that it is a European country uh, because historically, I mean, its identity... Uh, has been multi, right? I mean, it, if you look at its geography, I mean, it's okay. Its heart is in Anatolia, which means it's you know Middle Eastern in many ways. It's it's got the southern borders with uh, Syria and Iraq and Iran, and but also it, it geographically is a European country. I, I count Georgia as a European country, and and the Black Sea is its border to unfortunately the conflict between Ukraine and Russia, which is Europe's biggest military conflict since World War II. And then Turkey is a, a gateway for energy flows into, you know, not only Greece and, and onward to Albania and Italy, but also to Bulgaria. And, and then if you go back to the Ottoman Empire, I mean, really the sort of the, 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 the center uh, in many ways, uh, center of gravity of the Ottoman Empire was, was the Balkans. Matthew Breiser is a career diplomat and expert on Turkey, the Caucasus, and the Middle East and energy sector. He's also the former U.S. ambassador to Azerbaijan and the deputy assistant secretary of state for Europe and Eurasia, with the responsibilities for the Eurasian energy and South Caucasus. He also served as the co-chair for the OSCE's Minsk Group mediation in the Karabakh conflict and as the U.S. mediator for Cyprus, South Ossetia, and Abkhazia conflicts. Matt was also in the White House as the new director for European and Eurasian affairs on the national security staff. But more importantly, he's also a great friend of this show and we're thrilled to have him back. Now, you may be, in terms of uh, expansionists, be referring to Erdogan's most recent statements saying that, you know, Turkey is not going to stand by idly while it faces uh, th uh, Greek military threats. 
you, you, you may recall that Prime Minister Mitsotakis and President Erdogan had a very constructive meeting earlier this year. And, and that started to energize all sorts of cooperation. And uh, according to Erdogan, they agreed that uh, Pr Prime Minister Mitsotakis would not oppose publicly the attempts of Turkey to persuade the Biden administration and the entire U.S. government to sell Turkey F-16 fighter jets and, and upgrade packs to Turkey's existing uh, F-16s, 80 of them, in fact. And then Prime Minister Mitsotakis went to Washington and spoke before a joint session of Congress, and he did exactly that. He said, don't sell these things to Turkey. Now, that infuriated Erdogan, who viewed the, the, the potential purchase by Turkey of F-16s, which is something Turkey already possesses in, in large numbers, as a way to de-escalate the, the terrible dispute between Turkey and the United States on you know, the S-400 Russian air defense system Turkey had bought, which led to Turkey being banished by the F-35 fighter jet program. You know, Turkey had paid $1.3 billion for F-35s. The US said, you're never gonna get those because you bought those Russian air defense systems. So I think, after a standoff for a few years, Erdogan essentially said, OK, I give up. OK, just let me allocate those one point three billion dollars we've already paid for F-35s to the older generation F-16s. We have a lot of those already. And this is a way to get the U.S.-Turkey relationship back on track. So Erdogan viewed Mitsotakis as torpedoing that agreement. And then on August 23rd, according to the Turkish side, Greece uh, had its uh, radars from the Russian-made S-300 air defense system lock on Turkish uh, F-16s flying over the Aegean. Uh, that is considered a, a hostile act, uh, in some cases an act of war. And so Turkey has gone to NATO to explain its case. And then you had a couple of days ago, Turkey saying, we, we demand an agree, uh, explanation from Greece as to why it fired on uh, merchant vessels in Turkish waters, or the Greek Navy did. And also Turkey uh, has been very, uh, well, has been asking for explanations from Greece and from the European Union as to why Greece is reportedly pushing back uh, migrants on the Aegean Sea back into Turkey. So what I'm trying to say is here, there's been an action reaction cycle uh, between Greece and Turkey that looks like Turkey is being uh, aggressive, but from Turkey, it looks like Greece is, is being provocative, but that the, the rest of the transatlantic community is not paying attention to what Greece is doing from Turkey's perspective. Erdogan has been the forefront of the re-emergent regional Turkey, with Turkish forces now fighting in Somalia and Yemen and the Red Sea. So do you think this is an Erdogan policy or is this the new Turkey? That even if someone like the CHP were to win the next election, Turkey would continue down this path? Well, I, I think that Erdogan's foreign policies are not partisan. They're bipartisan in Turkey or multipartisan. And, you know, there's, there's not a lot of disagreement in the political opposition to Erdogan to his uh, foreign policies. When it comes to Libya, what Turkey has done is support the United Nations recognized government in Tripoli. Uh, and didn't recognize the the efforts by uh, Al Haftar, the, the warlord, as people call him, uh, to establish his own power center uh, outside of uh, the UN recognized government. So I think the Biden administration quietly recognizes that Turkey's approach was in the U.S.'s interests. In fact, uh, when it comes to Russia uh, in Libya uh, and in northwest Syria. It's only Turkey that has actually uh, fought Russian troops on the ground and decisively and successfully uh, forcing, in the case of Libya, uh, the Russian Wagner mercenaries to uh, flee and stopping Al Haftar's uh, assault on Tripoli, um, which really has, has stopped then the breakup of Libya, though it hasn't led to a solution of that country's brutal civil war. Uh, and in the case of Syria, uh, Turkey's retaliation to Russia's uh, attack back in February, March of 2020 that killed uh, 35 or so Turkish troops, um, Turkey responded uh, with drone strikes and artillery strikes, and that led Putin to sue for peace in Idlib, northwest Syria, uh, and then returned to the agreement that, that Turkey and Russia had brokered uh, to protect the civilian population of the pro in the province of Idlib. When it comes to the Eastern Mediterranean and all the di disputes there with Greece or with Turkey's support for Azerbaijan, uh, there, there will be no change regardless of who's in power in Turkey. A lot of Middle East analysts point to the competition for influence between Sunni-led Saudi Arabia and Shiite-led Iran. Where do you think Turkey sits within this dynamic though? 
I mean, Turkey clearly sided with Qatar when Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Egypt tried to isolate Qatar, right? And apparently with President Trump's support, on meaning uh, UAE, uh, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia. And then with the passage of Trump, well, we've seen um, the isolation of Qatar go away. And then Turkey uh, working very hard to, to normalize and strengthen its relations uh, first with UAE and then Saudi Arabia and then now with Egypt. Um, so uh, I, I think Turkey would like to strengthen as much as possible its business and investment ties and political ties with those three countries, UAE, Egypt and Saudi Arabia, in the sort of new era of improved relations with the, with the passage of Donald Trump and his maximalist, maximal pressure uh, uh, policy against Iran. Uh, I don't think Turkey is going to find a way to work very constructively with Iran. I mean, Turkey and Iran have been adversaries uh, uh, and at least competitors for hundreds of years. Um, there's no natural affinity between them. Uh, Turkey, of course, is a Sunni country and, and does aspire to be seen as a, a global leader of Sunnism. But really, I think even beyond that, I think Turkey aspires to be seen as a country that uh, is, is a beacon for all Muslims around the world uh, in terms of being able to develop a democracy, uh, warts and all, <laughs> and an economy that's really quite large with a diversified industrial base, even though the Turkish economy now is in trouble. Um, and, and from Turkey's perspective, as, as unusual as this may sound to some viewers, to serve as a stabilizing force uh, in international relations. Uh, I know, again, the whole tenor of this discussion is that many people view Turkey as aggressive and as destabilizing. From Ankara's perspective, uh, Turkey seeks to mediate conflict and, and reduce tension. Uh, uh, and, 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 and I think in Central Asia, uh, Turkey also hopes that it can play a similar role, uh, not to dominate these countries, because it can't. Um, the countries of Central Asia, the former Soviet countries that were Turkic, uh, four of them, they don't want Turkey to be their big brother, but they do welcome investment from Turkey. And on the Turkish side, as evidenced by the organization of Turkic states, Turkey wants to connect with the countries where, where, where to, the, to its east, um, where there, there's an echo of Turkic culture, Turkic, not Turkish, but Turkic culture, or there is Turkic culture, and use that to stabilize politics and security situation, and of course, uh, generate investment and, and therefore wealth to the benefit of, of Turkish companies and, and the countries uh, that are members of the Organization of Islamic States as well. When we had you back on the show last, back in January, we were talking back then about the terrible state of the Turkish economy and the weakness of the Turkish lira. Is the economy still that bad or has it gotten worse or has it gotten better? What is the state of the Turkish economy at the moment? Uh, the economy remains in, in, in worrisome shape. I mean, economic growth is strong. Uh, but inflation is so high and the lira is so weak that life is quite difficult for your average Turk. And I don't, I don't know how your average Turkish family is making it through this crisis. You know, the official inflation rate is 80 percent, but unofficially, you know, economists talk about 180 uh, percent year on year. And so that's that's really a, a harsh situation. Um, and that is causing uh, the AKP a lot of political support. People are blaming President Erdogan's unorthodox economic theory that the way to reduce inflation and strengthen uh, uh, the country's currency is to cut interest rates. Um, that's highly unorthodox. And each time the Turkish Central Bank has, either, has dropped interest rates or not raised them, kept them stable, um, we've seen increases in inflation and decreases in the value of the lira. And that's just made everyday life tougher and tougher for, for Turkish people, even if the economy you know, is growing in terms of you know, GDP. So that situation has not improved. Um, and I don't think it will until there's a different monetary policy in place by the Turkish government. <coughs> but I don't think there's any chance in that until the Turkish elections happen next year. Uh, and I don't know, you know, obviously don't know what the outcome will be. If the AKP wins, uh, well, then will they want to continue that policy or will they come come sort of to a new understanding that hmm, maybe maybe we need to pursue a more orthodox policy? I don't know. I think if the opposition wins, they will want to change the policy. Uh, I mean, theoretically, the Central Bank of Turkey is supposed to be independent, like all central banks of, of the government, but that's not how it's worked in Turkey lately. So I would guess if uh, the CHP and an opposition coalition won, um, they would also pr try to encourage the, the Turkish Central Bank to raise interest rates. But then if President Erdogan's still president, which I think is, is quite likely, 
uh, he would oppose that. And so we would be in a, a strange situation of, of policy drift, I fear. I feel like I'm channeling my inner Tim Marshall here. But as many disadvantages that Turkey has, its greatest gift is its geography. It sits right at the crossroads between Africa, Europe, Russia, and the Middle East. And with the war in Ukraine and Europe trying to divulge from Russian gas supplies, they'll be looking somewhere else for gas. Turkey is in competition over gas in the Mis Med at the moment, but putting that aside, even if you look to the big gas deposits in Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, and the Gulf, all of them would likely have to travel through Turkish pipes at some point in time. So Turkey is well-placed to become Europe's middleman for gas. So if that's the case, why isn't Turkey a top five player in the gas industry yet? Why do we really factor them into any conversation about energy supply coming out of the Middle East? Well, you, we have to separate that question out. I mean, to, what does it mean to be an energy giant? Um, Turkey doesn't have any significant um, supplies of oil or gas. I mean, it has discovered around 535 billion cubic meters of gas uh, in the Black Sea. Um, Turkey's going to use that domestically. I mean, Turkey's annual consumption is about 60 billion cubic meters per year. So that if you've got 535, you know, that's, that's several years of, you know, of, of, of Turkish domestic production, but that, that's not going to be used for export. And so it'll never be in a league, uh, unless it's geology changes, it'll never be in a league of the UAE or Saudi Arabia or Qatar in terms of energy exports. Where Turkey can play a huge role, however, is in energy transportation, as you said, bringing, move, moving uh, natural gas, uh, from Azerbaijan into Europe. I mean, Turkey already plays a, a big role in that by virtue of the Southern Corridor. Turkey, Turkey plays a big role in terms of moves, moving Caspian oil, Kazakhstani, Turkmenistani, Azerbaijani through the Bakut Tbilisi Jehan pipeline to the Mediterranean port of Jehan. Uh, but it could play a much bigger role in terms of natural gas transportation. Um, you know, the other huge supplier could be the United States. I'm sitting in Houston, Texas right now uh, in my, the business part of my life. There aren't a lot of places to land that gas right now, meaning regasification terminals on European coastlines to get that gas to strategically important and vulnerable re regions like, like the Balkans and Bulgaria. Turkey would, is key. It's got a lot of underutilized uh, natural gas import capacity. And I'm doing my very best to persuade the Turkish government and the national pipeline and gas purchasing monopoly, Botash, to say yes, bring that gas from the U.S. Uh, into Turkey. But so far, they haven't said yes. So um, I'm working on uh, finding ways to persuade them to say, OK, we do want to we realize to be that gas transportation hub that we've talked about for decades. We need to open up our gas transportation a bit uh, to more competition from outside. And I think Russia may be playing a role in trying to dissuade Turkey from doing what I just said, whereas the United States and Europe are encouraging Turkey to play that role. And so, you know, uh, 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 there are some difficult political economic decisions lying uh, ahead in the near future for Turkey to make. And where do you see Turkey within this industry in about 10 years time? Well, I, I, you know, I, I think Turkey's influence is is going to grow. It's inevitable. Um, it's going through a very difficult economic period right now, but it's going to get out of that. It's got you know, a huge, the biggest industrial base and most diversified industrial base in the Middle East. Uh, it has NATO's second largest military. Um, so its military ca capabilities absolutely dwarf those of any Middle Eastern country. And it, it has very um, attractive now um, defense technologies that all of those countries would like to get a hold of. So... Uh, and it's got an aspiration to be, yes, to be influential throughout the so-called Muslim world, a term I don't like, but for the sake of time, I'll use it. And so <coughs> it's up to Turkey to be attractive in the Middle East. Uh, it's up to Turkey to play its cards, cards wisely, to, to be a country that all these Middle Eastern countries want to work with. And I include Israel in the mix. Um, and there's been some significant improvement in Turkey-Israeli relations. If Turkey uh, continue on this path, and doesn't go back to the confrontational policies, <coughs> excuse me, we saw during the period when some of the Gulf countries were trying to isolate Qatar and Turkey was responding in kind, um, then I think we're gonna see Turkey's influence increase uh, substantially. But that'll also require its economy to get back on the right foot and, and get its policies in order uh, and see the lira strengthen again and see inflation go down. So what lies next for Turkey? Are they set to be the next big regional player, rebuilding a near Ottoman Empire? Or will their economy simply run out of steam and force them to retreat inward? Or is Turkey preparing for an upcoming power vacuum within the Middle East? Well, to answer that, we're doing to our final guest. 
Part 4. A Sharpening Shoreline Erdogan has uh, given up the idea that Turkey would be a lodestone for uh, democratic Islamic elements in the Middle East, uh, specifically the Muslim Brothers. That was behind his policies towards uh, Libya, Syria, uh, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, and Egypt in particular, uh, and his uh, special relationship with Qatar. While the relationship with Qatar is still strong, uh, it is clear that Erdogan no longer sees that as his future. Furthermore, Turkey uh, and the Kemalist, one foot in Europe, one foot in the Middle East, and then a third foot in Central Asia and the Caucasus. Jim Jeffrey is the chair of the Middle East program at the Wilson Center. He's also the former U.S. ambassador to Iraq, Turkey, and Albania, and also serves as the Secretary of State Special Representative for Syria Engagement and on the Special Envoy to the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS. So we're thrilled to have on the program today. And most importantly, the Turkish people, by and large, including more religious elements, have ties of one or another sort, particularly family or tourism and such, with Europe. They don't go on the Hajj, with a few exceptions. They don't travel to Egypt or to Beirut to have a good time. They see themselves as European. Uh, Erdogan recognizes that. And so while he maintains his cynical attitude towards Europe for two reasons, one is uh, Europe uh, has basically slammed the door on eventual Turkish membership. And secondly, uh, he sees Europe uh, supporting Greece and Cyprus, two EU countries, in a set of uh, territorial and other disputes are with them. So for those two reasons, uh, there's a limit to its integration into Europe, but nonetheless, it remains more a European than a Middle Eastern country, and its policies, are, including those of Erdogan, reflect that these days. How do you think Erdogan views Turkey standing within the Middle East? To secure his place in the region, do you think he'll look to push Turkey towards one of the regional blocs like the GCC, or do you think he envisions Turkey being influential enough to lead its own bloc? Turkey is a complicated problem, rather like France, rather like Japan, in that it is large enough, it is a member of not just uh, the European cultural and economic region, but it is part of, in many different ways, what we would call broadly the West. Yet it is a big enough country with a unique enough foreign policy uh, and specific regional interests to want to have a relatively independent role within that West. That's the same with France. It's the same with Japan. Uh, and therefore, uh, I think that Turkey will, as it is doing right now, form closer relations with the Saudis, with the Egyptians, with the Israelis and the Emiratis, all of whom uh, Erdogan has reached out to. And the purpose is, uh, first of all, to uh, resolve a variety of specific disputes, but more importantly, he is not sure of the degree to which the United States will remain in the region, and he wants regional allies because he's facing three threats. The first is from Russia to the north and to the south in Syria. The second is Iran, not just to its east, but also to its south in both Iraq and Syria, uh, and terrorism, beginning with the PKK, but also uh, uh, Arab terrorism, such as the Islamic State. So th those are many threats. Uh, and not sure of where Washington is, Erdogan is reaching out to all of these other countries who he knows uh, share his views towards uh, Iran, towards various terrorist groups, perhaps not to the same degree about Russia, but uh, at least two of the four is good enough for him. With Erdogan's warming toward the Emiratis and the Saudis, how do you envision the future relationship between Turkey and Iran? Do you think Turkey will look to freeze Iran out of the region even further to gain more favor with Riyadh and Abu Dhabi, or will they look to keep Iran on side to counterbalance the Saudis and the Emiratis? I think I will start by using an analogy. There are only five really big, powerful countries in the Middle East. Israel, Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. All have ambitions, all have a desire to be more powerful. But four are in one category, and one is in a second. Turkey... Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Israel are all in the same category as, say, France, Britain, Germany, and Italy and Europe. They're all competing to be have the biggest say, to have more influence, to be able to uh, exercise more dominance, but it's a sort of friendly and limited competition. 
Uh, and that's what you have between Turkey and those other states, with the exception of Iran. Iran is an expansionist state whose whole state ideology is based upon a mix of Shia Islam and nationalism that goes back uh, to the Persian Empire 3,000 years ago. And in that sense, at a regional level, looks a lot like Russia or China. So your behavior towards such a state is different than your behavior towards Egypt or Saudi Arabia. You may compete with them on one or another issue and one another place like Libya, but you basically don't see them as fundamentally hostile to you and a country that needs to be contained. Turkey feels that way about Iran. Iran represents a different kind of threat to Turkey, as it does to all of those other states I mentioned, than they do to each other, even though in some respects they're all competitors, just like you have competitors within Europe. With Turkey's expeditions into places like Libya and Somalia and the Red Sea, what do you think the long-term goals by Ankara are here? And if the Turkish economy continues to fall, do you think these operations will actually continue? Some of it is the afterglow of Erdogan's effort to be a regional alternative power. And as I said, that dream has largely faded because the idea of a Muslim brother fueled amalgam of uh, democracy, anti-elitism, anti-Westernism, and Islam that Erdogan was playing with uh, basically is not a potent force anymore, almost anywhere in the region. Some of his other engagements, for example, in Libya, are very much involved in Turkey's near abroad. You have to separate Turkey's near abroad from all of Turkey's other foreign policy. Near abroad is extremely important or existential, and Turkey is largely defensive. Libya is part of the Turkey near abroad problem because of uh, Greece's efforts with considerable support by uh, the European Union, particularly France, but also Israel, uh, to choke off Turkey's access to undersea uh, oil and gas and other riches uh, in the eastern Mediterranean. And therefore, Libya comes into play. Uh, It's the same with Iran, with Iraq, with Syria, with uh, the Caucasus up to Azerbaijan and the Black Sea area and the Southern Balkans. All of those areas are ones where Turkey has had much influence for hundreds of years at least. And uh, Turkey sees any true encroachment uh, by Greece in and of itself, not all that powerful, but with the backing of the EU, certainly uh, quite threatening to Turkey, uh, or from Iran, or from uh, Russia, or from something like the Islamic State or the PKK, in these sensitive areas to be a real danger to Turkey, and Turkey will react to it. The rest of this stuff, uh, bases in Somalia, the relationship with Qatar, those are nice to have things that any powerful country has, but they're not essential. The gas we're talking about in the East Med here sits across the territorial waters of Turkey, Greece, Cyprus, well, the Republican part and the Turkish Align part, Lebanon, Syria, Israel, and Egypt. Turkey has obviously pushed back against Athens taking a share of this one, But do you think they'll look to form an agreement with Middle Eastern countries to try and counter Greek claims? Or do you think they'll try and take the lion's share of this for themselves? A year ago, I would have been more pessimistic vis-a-vis Turkey. I would have thought Turkey was more pessimistic. But several things have happened. One is Turkey has found significant gas in the Black Sea. That doesn't make Turkey less interested in uh, gas in the uh, uh, eastern Mediterranean, but it still gives Turkey more flexibility. Secondly, with the Ukraine crisis, Turkey's importance as a supplier of gas from Azerbaijan to Europe has increased. Greece and Cyprus aren't providing any gas to anybody. In fact, Greece is getting gas from Turkey. Uh, That's the second point. The third point is that uh, with the uh, efforts by Erdogan, uh, with the Israelis, very successful, with France, less successful, and least successful with Greece, but still with these efforts to try to uh, paper over diplomatic differences. Uh, And finally, with uh, the U.S. pulling out of the Eastern Mediterranean gas uh, effort, we were an unofficial but important member, uh, all of that has taken the bloom off the rose of Eastern Mediterranean gas projects uh, beyond the specific Israeli ones. And so Turkey has much more leverage to play its various um, cards than it had two years ago. It certainly isn't doing any more military confrontations other than the usual overflights 
uh, of uh, airspace Greek planes as its own, but we've seen that for 40 years. But the kind of naval exercises and threats we saw a year, a year and a half ago, I don't see will return. Turkey is making a real name for itself in the arms industry at the moment, selling naval motors to Pakistan and arms into Central Asia, and quite notably the Bayraktar drones. Do you think Turkey is looking to become the main arms exporter to countries who can't afford US or EU tech, but also don't want to buy Russian tech? Are they hoping to corner that part of the market? Uh, Sure, for two reasons. One is it's an area of uh, Turkey has value added, uh, beginning with drones, but many other areas, including aviation in general. Secondly, uh, Turkey has seen repeatedly uh, the impact of U.S. embargoes for political reasons on Turkey. Uh, the S-400 sale and the subsequent uh, uh, sanctions on Turkey, and particularly the painful fallout by the U.S. of its collaboration with Turkey on the F-35 purchase, uh, the arms embargo from Sweden, which was one of the conditions for Turkey giving the green light for Sweden to begin NATO accession. This is something that really, 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 really irritates Turkey. I cannot stress so much. They basically bought the S-400, not because it's a better system, not because the Russians, uh, well, they offered them a better deal in terms of uh, co-production and offsets and such, but the Russians haven't, and technology transfer, but the Russians haven't delivered on any of it, and the Turks knew it. They did that basically to spite the United States and foolishly and incorrectly, but understandably, to think that, well, if they think we can go someplace else, they'll be more willing to uh, talk Turkey with us, so to speak. Uh, But the United States, particularly the U.S. Congress, which controls most of these armed sanctions, uh, doesn't think in a rational uh, marketplace way. Uh, It basically uses this in a spiteful, uh, self-defeating, from my standpoint, uh, effort uh, to play foreign policy in one of the areas where Congress uh, has to lead, which is arms sales. So Turkey has no faith in the United States. Uh, uh, even though it purchases most of its weapons. So it is working very hard to develop its own uh, domestic arms industry. And the best way to do that is to find a market so that you can do economies of scale and produce three or four times what you need. Then the stuff you buy for yourself uh, is much less expensive. With Europe clambering for gas at the moment, with Russia exiting the market, do you think pipelines like the Trans-Anatolian pipeline that goes from the Azeri gas fields through Turkey into Europe will become more important? And in such, do you think Turkey will become a major player in the gas industry going forward? No, the infrastructure is there. The, uh, uh, for example, uh, if the situation in Iraq could clarify, the Kirkuk Jehan pipeline could uh, carry 1.6 million barrels a day. Uh, They're getting about a million barrels from Azerbaijan a day of oil. Uh, They're also getting uh, significant quantities. I think uh, it's ranging between 10 and 20 BCM from um, Azerbaijan, either uh, underway now or planned. Uh, They also get gas from Russia. And some of this goes on through uh, this Trans-Balkan pipeline all the way to Italy, and Turkey is trying to further develop that. In addition, unlike, say, Germany, Turkey uh, invested heavily in uh, LNG infrastructure, and it has increased dramatically its LNG purchases, mainly from the United States, thus reducing its dependency on Iranian and Russian gas, exactly what the Europeans should have and didn't do. But this also gives Turkey more flexibility because it does have that infrastructure. Uh, So bit by bit, particularly helped by the discovery of gas in the Black Sea, uh, Turkey will become an ever more important energy supplier. It'll be another part of the Turkish portfolio of uh, essentially uh, necessity for Europe to work with Turkey, be it on refugees, be it on NATO, be it on uh, geopolitical issues, or be it on energy. Uh, Turkey is very much integrated into Europe, and Europe is quite dependent on it. Turkey has been talking a lot about its counterterrorism fighting capabilities throughout the region. And the obvious terror spot nearby is Afghanistan, especially now that the US has at least officially left. Do you think that Turkey will look to play a bigger role in the restabilization of Afghanistan going forward? As part of your diplomatic portfolio, I mean, this is what we do as diplomats when we're sitting in Washington or in Ankara. Uh, trying to think of how our country can win kudos from important countries. Afghanistan, 
uh, is for Turkey quite important because it has long-term uh, ties and it has a fairly good relationship with the Taliban compared to most other countries. Uh, Turkey would like to play a role, uh, not so much because of the intrinsic benefits of Afghanistan, although it does have a very uh, a considerable mineral wealth, but rather to counter Iran to and to win support from Europe, from the United States, and from Pakistan, which are all important to Turkey, and to some degree to counter Russian influence as well. So yeah, Turkey will try to play as big a role as it can in Afghanistan, probably partnered with Qatar. The Turkish are very much in need of capital injections at the moment to get themselves out of this financial situation. Right now they are looking to Qatar and the Gulf states, but if these countries can't fill that need, do you think they will turn to China for the additional funding? For not just Turkey, but for all of the countries of the Middle East, China begins and ends with economic partner. It is an important economic and trade partner of everyone in the region. And China so far has made no geopolitical demands. Its military presence in the region is minimal. It has some, but not very much. It uh, is very quiescent on most political issues. Uh, notably on the most recent UN Security Council vote on Syria, uh, specifically the uh, humanitarian crossing between Turkey and uh, the Idlib uh, region that Russia was so difficult on. Uh, China did not support Russia, but basically took a neutral position. We see this all the time. China so far is not interested in getting involved deeply in the Middle East. I've heard this from senior Chinese officials myself in the last two months. Because of that, and because of the fact there are obviously major benefits to uh, having an economic relationship with China, uh, everybody sees this solely in trade and economic terms. Well, what about Turkey's relationship with the United States? There were some people who were annoyed at Turkey after they tried to hold Finland and Sweden's entry into NATO hostage. But how do you see the future of the Turkish-US relationship going forward? This is a question more about the US than about Turkey. Turkey wants a close relationship with the United States and puts considerable effort into it, uh, not compromising some of its key principles and its near abroad. That's why we have difficulties with Turkey about our support for the PKK off to the YPG in Syria, that's Turkey's near abroad, or our unwillingness to take Turkey's side on various Aegean disputes with Greece, that's the near abroad too. And nonetheless, Turkey wants a close relationship with us. And the problem is the United States. I have to start by having been a diplomatic soldier for my country for 50 years. I love my country and uh, believe it to be uh, a unique force for peace, stability, and progress in the world. Nonetheless, in terms of a diplomatic actor, we are not world class. Our foreign policy is divided. It is too focused on domestic issues. And power is dispersed not only between various uh, bureaucratic centers within the administration, but dramatically with the U.S. Congress. Turkey is a pain in the neck or another part of the anatomy for many groups that have political influence in America. Armenians, Greeks, the human rights lobby, a Kurdish lobby, and these are all inimical towards Turkey, and they're inimical towards the United States having good relations uh, with Turkey. And the U.S., particularly the U.S. Congress, but also the administration, has to respond to that. It wants supine, cuddly partners and allies that don't create problems with Congress, don't create problems in the media, and do what the United States says. Turkey, however important it is to us, doesn't behave like that. So the relationship will always be rocky. It's a positive one. It's not going to break down, but it's never going to be very good. It's never going to be like our relationship with Britain or our relationship with, say, uh, small countries that don't pose problems, even if they do nothing like, uh, make nothing like the contributions that Turkey uh, makes, such as uh, Denmark. Our relations will always be better with Denmark than with Turkey, despite the fact that Turkey is 100 times more important and contributes 100 times more. That's not a criticism of Denmark, which punches above its weight. It's just it's a small country and it doesn't have the capabilities uh, to help the alliance, to help the United States. Turkey does. But nonetheless, the United States shouldn't, but does, respond to these petty uh, irritants, these 
pressure groups. It gets all upset about buying one set of Russian missiles, even though Turkey has bought $100 billion worth of American weapons over the past uh, 40 years. It just goes on and on. We are not good at managing relations with difficult partners. Uh, the French could sing the same song as uh, Erdogan does. And my final question to bring this to a bit of an end here is, do you think this form of adventurism and these bold foreign policy moves from Turkey will continue even if Erdogan's not in power? Is this the Erdogan doctrine? Or is this just the new path for Turkey? There is a standard Turkish foreign policy that I encountered in the early 1980s in my first tour there that continues today and will continue on. It is, as I said, one, a uh, member of the West and will not deviate from that because that's hardwired into the population, into the millions of Turks who've gone on to live in uh, Europe. Uh, and a considerable number to the United States where they've been very successful. Uh, so Turkey is committed to the West in basic ways. Two, uh, it's a status quo power, and it sees itself threatened by some of the same problems we and our partners in Europe and the Middle East see, Iran, Russia, terrorism. Uh, but three, Turkey is... Uh, an independent, serious player that will go its own way and resent efforts to uh, align itself with the United States. The adventuresome policies of Erdogan that deviated from this basic Turkish focus on its nationalist position, its near abroad, and <clears throat> its status quo alliances and partners, uh, both good and bad on Erdogan's part. In the early years, uh, he sent President Gould to our Yerevan to patch relations with Armenia. He accepted the Anand plan for Cyprus. He did several ceasefires with the PKK. He was trying his best in a way we hadn't seen before uh, to mend these crises or problems in his near abroad. Uh, that has gone because it, nobody gave him any credit for this. Uh, he was, felt it was slapped in the face by the European Union uh, over the Anand plan for Cyprus, slapped in the face of our, our Turkish membership, slapped in the face by the Obama administration on all sorts of issues. So he dropped this uh, conciliatory approach. He then tried, again, a new departure in Turkish uh, foreign policy, uh, this uh, Islamic beacon for the whole Middle East approach for roughly a decade. That got him nowhere, just irritation with uh, the Saudis, Emiratis, Egyptians, and Israelis. Those are big plays economically, militarily, and diplomatically. And he decided that's not paying off. So he's got back to something like the standard Turkish policy. Now, he might deviate if he stays in office uh, a bit more uh, towards more conciliatory or more confrontational, but it will be a standard deviation of just limited uh, uh, movement. If anybody else comes in, uh, they will be less adventuresome to, uh, in terms of uh, their foreign policy than Erdogan uh, was. That means they'll be less willing to make concessions to reconcile with uh, enemies or uh, opponents, uh, but also less likely to... Uh, strike out on their own. Nonetheless, the problem is uh, they may conduct a basically incompetent foreign policy. That is what Erdogan is doing now, only not as successfully as Erdogan has done it, because Erdogan is willing to take chances. He is a major player. Uh, he is uh, uh, working closely with all of the leaders in the region. He works closely with Putin. Uh, Europeans hold their noses, but they do have to deal with him and uh, recognize that he is a powerful international player. Uh, I don't know if the next Turkish leader will have that stature. And that means that they will not be as uh, important a foreign policy player as Erdogan for all of his flaws is today. So what can Turkey really do? Their path to full European citizenship is pretty much blocked. And time and time again, when push comes to shove on issues around missiles or jets or maritime borders or Greek disputes, the domestic politics in these countries is placed above the Turkish needs. Well, Central Asia is an option and it's a good friend, but being so far away and being on the other side of an often guarding Russia, it may not be the game changer Ankara is looking for right now. So what about the Middle East? Even after some awkwardness around the Arab Spring, the Middle East is still willing to embrace the Turks. 
with nations like Qatar and the UAE throwing money and assistance toward Turkey. But unlike Europe, the Middle East is far less unified. Iraq feels like it could snap in three at any moment, Syria is still a mess nearly a decade on, and siding with Iran or Saudi Arabia means making your life difficult with the other. Also, while the sort of Damocles hangs over everyone's head, knowing that if the US leaves or oil loses its importance, the area is sure to become even more chaotic. But unlike Europe, Turkey would be a big fish in this pond, and it can have much more say in the affairs of this region than it ever could within Europe. So what should Turkey do? Remain a hopeful European or pivot toward a fractured Middle East? That is the decision the Turks need to make for themselves, as by the looks of it, the military won't be making that decision for them anymore. Thank you so much to everybody who tuned into the show this week. I always love doing episodes in the Middle East, and with this week's lineup, we knew it would be an interesting one. On top of all our regular episodes, there's been another project the Redline team has been working on for almost a year now. And after a year of research and work and calls and pouring over data, we're excited to announce that the trailers for it will be dropping this Wednesday. So I won't spoil too much, but I'm pretty excited to finally announce this project. You'll find out more on Wednesday. You can find all the links and info on our Twitter, Reddit, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, and TikTok on the handle at the Redline Pod. Or you can follow me on Twitter personally as I'm on the handle at Michael Eat Oz. Oz is in Australia. This show is completely funded by our amazing Patreons, who donate a small amount of money each month to help us keep this show going. And speaking of our Patreons, this episode is dedicated to friend of the show, Philip, who is the latest Patreon to sign up as of time of recording. The only reason we can keep this show running is with the support of people like Philip, and we cannot thank them enough. So if you think you can spare a couple of dollars and want to see this show keep going, we greatly appreciate it. But for now, this episode on Turkey's goals in the Middle East goes out to you. So thanks, Philip. As usual, here are three book recommendations. The first is Erdogan's Empire by Sönür Kagapti for a look at Erdogan's pivot in politics and how it shaped the modern Turkey. The second is Religious Politics in Turkey by Karen Lord for a complete analysis on the transition from the Ottomans to the Republic to the modern Turkish state. And the third is The History of the Modern Middle East by Peter Mansfield for a much more region-wide perspective look. I'd like to thank this week's guests, Gunnar Toll, Rich Altson, Matthew Breiser, and Jim Jeffries. I don't think we could have asked for a better panel on this subject, and we were thrilled to have you all on the show. I also want to thank my staff, Weber Carr, the producer, Perry Grace, Daniel Luzivella, Isaac Gibbs, Andrew Garbery, and Robbie Sutton, their research assistants and writers, Francis Leach, our director of Breaking News, Mark Spencer, our second voiceover artist, Jonah Gunn, our production assistant, Jamie Tanu, our media director, Ross Crabtree, our media revisor, Joe Hawthorne, our audio cleaner, Marissa Rafter, our videographer, and Nick Much, our field correspondent. If you're looking for the absolute best research team in the entire world, it's this one. And I'm so grateful to be working with them each week. The Red Line will be back in another fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you for listening, and good night. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael, our guests, and the Red Line podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. For more information, please visit theredlinepodcast.com.